Hi there. Uh, I don't think anybody has joined the broadcast yet. Uh, so this message is for those of you watching it uh, as a video after the fact. Um, I just wanted to say that at the bottom of each of the videos, I'm going to put some links that uh, tell you the, the critical times of the videos. So if there's usually there's going to be, I don't know, five, 10 minutes of technical things where we're sorting stuff out at the beginning of the talk. And obviously for the video, you won't want to watch that. So just look beneath the videos and there'll be some times that you can click on that will fast forward a few minutes uh, into the video and you can see you know the the meat of the video and and the the questions at the end and so on so you'll be able to find those easily um and similarly i'm just going to wait a few minutes now uh, i can see at the screen how many people have joined and i'm just going to wait for a little while to, to let people join before i start so uh click on that link now if you don't want to be bored Hi there, viewers. Just wait, giving people a bit of time to, to, to join up, and I'll probably be starting in maybe three minutes or something like that. We had a bit of uh, technical issues. Marek was going to be uh, chairing this, uh, but, uh, but we had some technical issues at the beginning. Maybe we'll still see if we can make that work. Hi, Marek. Hello, and my apologies for late arrival. No problem. It looks like you're capable of speaking, which is good. It means you haven't joined as a, as a, as a watcher, but as a participant. So that that seems good. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna unplug that there. Do you have control of the camera or anything like that? Uh, it doesn't look like it. I don't have. Uh, no, let me. I'm, I'm sharing the controls with you now. Yes, it looks like I do have control of the camera. Great. Just waiting for another couple of minutes for people to join because we started right on, on the at nine. So I think it's only fair to give people uh, the, the chance to check in. Mm -hmm. And I've got confirmation from one viewer that they're watching and can see the video is up and running. So that's great to know. Thank you for that, Matt. So do you think you'd like to to, to steer then, Mark? Um, I will give that a shot. I'll just um, make sure that everything, seeing things are a little bit, um, Jerky from my end, but I think I think we'll be okay. Okay. Um, it's good that uh, Merrick is presenting me to everyone, so I think that worked. It looks like you do have control. That's great. Okay. So um, I I'm not sure if people can actually see me at the moment, um, but if uh, if you can hear me, then that's all that's required, um, because it is a sort of very good um, great pleasure for me to introduce the um, driving force originator um, and, and sort of primary technical person, as we'll have noticed, 
um, of the Ensel Seminar Series, um, Matthew Egbert. Matthew is a graduate of the University of Sussex, um, like so many inactivists are, and um, has completed postdocs at places like the University of Hertfordshire and is currently ensconced in Harvard um, just to kill some time over the past year and a half or so um, before taking up a position at the University of Auckland in the, the coming year. Um, so I think I'm very uh, looking forward to the, the work that Matthew's going to present today, which I think is based on some of the work you did in Hartford, Hertfordshire, sorry. Um, and so without further ado, I shall ensure that you are able to present everyone and invite you to tell us about habit-based regulation of essential variables. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Merit. I'm going to just get the screen share going on here so you can see my slides. I'll do the entire screen and get some infinite regress going on, Woo! and then toggle over to the actual slides and present. Does that look good to you, Marek? Yep, you are up and running. OK, great. So yeah, thanks very much uh, for the in introduction. Uh, as you said, this is work that I carried out uh, when I was at the University of Hertfordshire, uh, which is yeah closing in on, on two years ago, I guess a year and a half. Um, and. Uh, it's work that's very much inspired and related to other work that's going on in the inaction community, but I've never really had the opportunity to present it to, to this community. So I'm glad uh, to have this, this forum now to do that. Uh, okay, so uh, one uh, autonomy is sort of a, a classical uh, theme in, in the inactive community. Uh, there's a lot of people looking at the notion of autonomy in different contexts. Um, and of course, autonomy means a lot of different things to different people. But in this group, um, and the way I'm using it, I'm using it to refer to the idea that a system can be built out of several interdependent components. And each one of these components uh, makes it possible for other components in the group to persist. And also, each component within the system depends upon others to persist. I uh, first came across this idea in the context of autopoiesis. Uh, where uh, there was a model that was present, uh, developed in, in the 1970s by Maturana and Varela and Uribe, where you have a membrane, or, or it's a very sim a simple abstract model of a cell, where there is a membrane, which is depicted here on the right as a yellow uh, circle. And this membrane is constantly degrading over time, but because of chemical reactions that are going on inside the membrane, it's being replaced, uh, repaired. Uh, and so, the membrane depends upon the chemical reactions, but for the chemical reactions to occur, the membrane also needs to be in place. Uh, so you have, uh, because if the membrane wasn't there, then these chemicals would, would diffuse away and there wouldn't be in high enough concentration to interact with each other. So you have this kind of situation where the membrane depends upon the chemical reactions and the chemical reactions depend upon the membrane. So you have this system of interdependent uh, components. Um, and I think as soon as you start thinking about autonomous systems defined in this way, pretty quickly you start thinking about uh, uh, notions of viability. So what are the conditions in which this kind of system is going to persist? And what are the conditions in which it's going to sort of die? Um, and you can, you can have this sort of binary distinction of, of uh, persisting and not persisting, but then you can also uh, think about uh, more subtle uh, concepts of viability. Uh, is the system healthy or unhealthy? Meaning, can you, it, if you give it a small perturbation or break it a little bit, does it survive? Well, if it takes just only a small perturbation to break it, then maybe it's not as healthy than a, a similar system that uh, is capable of being robust to quite violent perturbations of different kind, kinds. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a, a difficult issue in its own right, and I know uh, some people are doing work to try to quantify the viability of these kinds of systems. Aaron Agmon is going to be talking about uh, some of these, uh, some of his work in this area uh, early next year uh, in an ENSO seminar. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail about the concept of viability, but I just wanted to sort of uh, introduce these ideas. And in particular, I wanted to introduce the concept of essential variables and viability limits uh, for any of those of you watching that are not familiar with these with these words with this terminology. So, in the context of the viability of these autonomous systems there are variables which have been called essential variables. And these are uh, values that must remain within a certain range, which is called the viability limit, uh, if the system's to remain healthy. So these are easy to think about when you think about regular natural uh, biological systems. So the, the 
body temperature and the viability limits are what are those boundaries? What, what is too high a temperature and what's too low a temperature? And you've got lots of other essential variables as well. Your blood sugar uh, can't be too high, can't be too low if the system's to be healthy. So all I've described so far uh, is a system property. So it's a way that you can look at a system or certain kinds of systems will have this property. But I haven't been specific about any particular domain that I'm talking about. Uh, so the examples I've given have been all in the context of biology and thinking about uh, an autonomous organism, a self-maintaining organism that has its own viability limits, its own essential variables. Uh, and I, I've used these examples because I think this is the easiest place to, to see examples or to, to be introduced to the notion of autonomy, the way it's thought of uh, in the inactive community. But it's not the only place that we can think about autonomy. Uh, you can also think about these concepts that I've, I've been discussing in the context of uh, behavior and think instead about a self-maintaining organism that's precarious and has built out of interdependent components, you can think about behaviors with their own essential variables and their own viability limits. And uh, if you haven't uh, thought about behaviors in this way, it, it can be a little bit uh, confusing or not clear. And the way I like to introduce uh, the idea, uh, it's not a perfect example, but I, but I think it, 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 it gets, gets the idea across is to think a little bit about smoking. Uh, so when you, you perform the act of smoking a cigarette, it increases the odds that you'll smoke a cigarette uh, later uh, again. Uh, and so you have this idea that you've got this pattern of behavior that's reinforcing itself. Uh, and there are, if you think about that pattern of behavior, there's going to be certain conditions where that it's going to be able to persist and other conditions where it's, it's not, uh, it won't. Uh, and so this relates to the notion of essential variables and viability limits. Now, maybe it's more difficult to put your finger on exactly what the essential variable is for a particular pattern of behavior, uh, or maybe, you know, or, or its viability limits. Similarly, it might be more difficult than in the biological examples I gave before. But nevertheless, you can, you can start to, to at least think about this metaphor of our patterns of behavior autonomous in a way that we have thought of biological organisms being autonomous. Uh, and just as one other note, uh, this doesn't just apply to uh, addictive uh, scenarios, you know, like smoking cigarettes and nicotine and so on, but there's a lot of behavior that's habitual that takes this form where if you perform an, a behavior, you're more likely to repeat it in the future. Um, and, and so this is related to the idea of habits, which I'm going to touch on a little bit more uh, in this talk later on. Um, so as soon as you, you if, if you're willing to, to embrace this idea that there might be some metaphorical similarity between the autonomy of biological systems and the autonomy of, of behavioral systems, uh, then, then you get into this interesting situation, which Marek touched on uh, last month, where you can have sort of multiple concurrent overlapping autonomous systems that are affecting the same, the same organism, the same being. You have the biological autonomy, which has the, its interdependent components, some membranes and maybe chemical reactions going on in ATP, DNA, all of these kinds of things. Uh, that create the body of the organism, uh, and and that that entity, that biological autonomous structure, has uh, has its own essential variables and it has its viability limits. So it has its blood sugar and temperature requirements and so on. But at the same time, at least for some organisms, there's also the possibility of having a behavioral autonomous structure, where you have behavior mechanisms that are built out of their own interdependent components, which might involve neuro, uh, brain activity. Uh, and then interaction with the world and, and, and an interdependent relationship between these two things. Uh, and you also will have behaviors, as I mentioned, with their own essential variables and their own uh, viability limits. Uh, and so once you acknowledge that you have these two concurrent, two or more even uh, overlapping autonomies, you get to ask the question, which I find very interesting, which is what is the relationship between these two uh, autonomous structures that are operating over the same material? So they're constraining each other, they're influencing each other. Big open question, I don't, I don't know, of course, all of the ways that they're influencing each other. But there's one more specific question which I'm particularly interested in, which is what I've written on the left here. In what conditions is what's good for the behavior good for the biology? So as examples to sort of clarify this question, if you think about the example I gave of smoking, the act of smoking is good for the act of smoking in the sense that it makes it more likely for smoking to recur but it's bad for the person doing the smoking. 
So you have a conflict in terms of what's good for the behavior and what's good for the biology. Uh, a, counter, a different example is exercise. When you exercise a lot, you get into shape and ex exercising becomes more easy and you're more likely to perform more exercise. So performing exercise is good for exercise, the, the, the behavior, but it's also good for the organism uh, within reason. Uh, so you can have these two different relationships between these, these two concurrent uh, uh, overlapping autonomous structures. Uh, and I'm curious, what sort of processes can bias the formation of the behavioral structures uh, to, to, to be good for, for the organism that's performing the behavior? Because obviously we, we wouldn't be doing very well uh, if we were you know, doing only things that were bad for us all the time. So there could be things like evolution and selection pressures, but, but what are the, the, the more ontogenetic, the more lifetime scale uh, processes that are biasing the formation of behavior to be good for the, the biology? And to uh, investigate this question, I've uh, developed uh, uh, a computer model, a computational model. And as I said, this is work that I did a while ago uh, at Hertfordshire, but work that I'm looking forward to returning to and, and would love to speak with people if they're interested in, in working in a similar model. Um, this is a model that includes, at the same time, some degree of um, a model of biological autonomy and also of behavioral autonomy. And this is a bit of a theme in, in my computational simulations. Uh, so I'm going to describe the model in three steps. First, I'm going to describe uh, a simulated robot and environment that it's in. I'm going to describe how I've simulated this robot as having uh, a biological essential variable, which is blood sugar. So it's a very simple model of how this robot has some uh, biological autonomy. It's not a detailed model, but it's, it suffices for what I want to investigate. And then uh, I'm going to describe the controller of the robot and how uh, it uh, enables the robot to, to have behavior that can be considered autonomous. Uh, and these behaviors are built out of habits, as I'll, I'll explain in a moment. OK, so the robot uh, and environment, uh, this is a, a very typical sort of uh, setup for those of you familiar with evolutionary robotics. Uh, I have a two-wheeled robot that's moving around an environment. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is the, the robot down here in this picture in the lower right-hand corner of the square. And it has two wheels, and it has two directional sensors. And by varying the rate at which its wheels are turning, it can trace different trajectories through this environment. Um, and it has there's periodic boundaries. So if it, the robot goes off the right-hand side of the screen, so to speak, it will come back around on the left-hand side of the screen. Um, and then its two uh, directional sensors are capable of detecting a light that's placed uh, in the middle of the arena. Uh, in also one last detail of this, uh, this environment is there's this food region. So whenever the robot is within a certain radius of the, the distance, a certain distance from the light, it's within this food region and it's considered to be eating. And whenever it's outside of that region, it's considered to be not eating. And this eating and, and not eating affects its essential variable, which is blood sugar, which I'll describe now. So, in addition to being able to move around the environment, this robot has uh, uh, an essential variable, which has been very loosely inspired by uh, an inadequately regulated uh, blood sugar levels. So this is loosely speaking, this robot has, has diabetes. So uh, if, so we, okay, so we've got glucose here is the essential variable. There's one variable that is the essential variable and that's glucose and this is blood sugar level. And you see that plotted in, in the top uh, figure here. Uh, and this variable is an essential variable. It has viability limits, which I've, I've just defined uh, in an ad hoc way, which are depicted by the, the dashed red lines. So whenever uh, the glucose levels go below or above those uh, red lines, then that's bad for the organism. It means that it's, it's incurring some damage. The blood sugar level is too high. It's unhealthy. Um, but this robot does have some functioning hormones that prevent this, the, the glucose levels from diverging too, too radically. So when the, the glucose levels go too high, something analogous to insulin kicks in in a delayed manner. And a moment later, the system is returned back to within the viable region, similarly for the lower boundary. Um, if you look at the, the top plot here, you see what happens. The blue line indicates when the robot is eating all of the time. When the robot's eating, the, the blood sugar levels will go up and up and up and up and up, and then it will encounter the viability limits. The hormones will kick in, the insulin kicks in and brings it back down to within the viable region, but the robot keeps eating because this is sort of 
one of the worst possible strategies it could employ. It keeps eating, the, gluco the insulin kicks in again, and so on. And this robot keeps uh, uh, being damaged in the process. The other situation is depicted by this uh, the dark black line, which is showing what happens when the robot never eats. So when it never eats, the blood sugar levels go down, down, and then the glucagon kicks in and releases sugar into the blood from, from fat stores is the idea. Uh, and But again, some damage is incurred. So these two strategies of always eat and never eat are obviously quite bad strategies. It's going to accrue a lot of damage. But you can, I'm sure, see that if you regulate when you eat, you eat some here and you stop for a while and eat a little bit again, you can, you can move along within the viable region and not incur any damage. The uh, third uh, and final part of the model uh, is the most involved to describe, and this uh, is the robot controller which is a, a new kind of controller uh, that I developed uh, along with uh, Xavier Barandi around that, uh, a few years ago now. And it's called the uh, IDSM, which stands for the Iterant Deformable Sensory Motor Medium, or more easily said is it's a habit-based controller. And I'm going to describe how that works to you now. It's published in, uh, in a couple of uh, articles, which I linked to on the ENSO seminars website if you want to know about it in more detail. But this is going to be a very conceptual introduction to how, the, how it works. So to understand how the IDSM works, you need to have some basic understanding of uh, sensory motor space. Uh, and so this is a one slide crash course in sensory motor space uh, for those of you that are not already familiar with it. So imagine that you have a very, very simple robot depicted here on the left. This robot has one motor and one light sensor. And the robot uh, can move, use its motor to move forwards or backwards, and that's it. It can't turn or anything like that. It can only move forwards and backwards. And placed in front of it is a light, which, in, which influences the, the single sensor on, on the robot. So if you imagine that the robot's motor, I'm sorry, if the robot's motor causes it to move left and right, back and forth in front of the light, then you can draw a trajectory in what's called sensory motor space, which describes the state of the motors and the state of the sensors in, in a spatial way. So if we imagine that the robot starts at the point farthest away from the light, indicated by the blue X, then we can say, and it's stationary initially, but it's going to move forward. So it starts, it's stationary, and it's far away from the light. So we can say that it's starting at this point in sensory motor space. It then starts to move forward, which means that its motor is in, it's in this area here. It's positive. And this causes it to move towards the light, which means that the light sensor is going to go up. And so it's moving forward at its quickest point here on the rightmost point of the trajectory. And then it starts slowing down, but it's still moving forward until it comes to a complete stop at its point closest to, to, the, to the light. And then it starts going backwards. Uh, and and you, what we have here is a circular uh, trajectory through sensory motor space, where on one axis we have a sensor, the light sensor, and on the other axis we have the motor. Uh, if we were to have a more complex robot, this space that's being used to describe the state of the sensors and the motors would be would have more dimensions. So I uh, deliberately picked a simple robot just to have uh, to to be able to plot the trajectory in sensory motor space. But it's possible to have a robots with five dimensional sensory motor space or, or even higher, of course. Uh, I hope that that gets across the idea of sensory motor space. So the IDSM, the Iterant Deformable Sensory Motor Medium tracks trajectories taken in sensory motor space and uses that information to increase the likelihood that in the future, similar trajectories will be taken in sensory motor space. So a metaphor that I like to use to describe this is to think about paths taken in a, in a field. Uh, when you first come to a field, let's say nobody's ever walked in the field before, you might pick a path a bit at random to get you where you want to go. But after people have taken paths again and again and again, you get these ruts that are carved through the grass and those ruts, in fact, influence where you're likely to walk. And in a similar way, an IDSM controller can start off kind of like a, a, a clear grassy field where you might move in random way. But after a while, these paths in sensory motor space get etched into the, into the IDSM and cause it to take similar trajectories in the future. Slightly, slightly more technically, this is how the IDSM works. So here we have uh, a trajectory through sensory motor space indicated by the gray arrow on the left. So this is just an initial, say, random trajectory through the sensory motor space. And the IDSM will keep track of that trajectory by creating what are called nodes, which basically say, at this point, sensory motor space, uh, the, the sensory motor velocity was so-and-so. And these arrows sort of capture how the, the sensory motor state changed over time. 
Then later on, you've got another trajectory that comes along, and when it encounters one of these previously recorded nodes, it gets pulled into this trajectory that was taken before. Over time, the nodes degrade. So that's shown here by them being sort of become more blurred out. But when the nodes are revisited, they can be reinforced. So here we see that same second trajectory from a slide a couple back, a couple slides back. And you see the trajectory comes along and reinforces the bottom four or five nodes that, that were revisited. And what where this controller becomes interesting is when you get into patterns like this one, where you have the right conditions set up so that you have a trajectory through the sensory motor space that's a cycle that gets to becomes a self-reinforcing pattern of behavior. So the behavior itself causes the robot to move in such a way that it can repeat the behavior that it performed in the past. And you can have these, these habits, at, which this is what we call habits, and you can have these self-reinforcing patterns of behavior persist for very long periods of time. But of course, they can be perturbed and broken and things like that as well. So that's the entire uh, situation. I described to you the robot in its environment. I described this blood sugar essential variable, which is sort of inadequately regulated. Uh, and then I described to you the IDSM. And what we did or what was to take uh, that situation and, and to, to, to investigate two scenarios. The experimental condition was that we had a five-dimensional sensory motor space. So we had the two motors, the two sensors, and, and the blood sugar as, an, as, as, sensory, as parts of the sensory motor st uh, space, dimensions of it. In the control scenario, we have the same thing except without the glucose. So we just have the robot being sensitive to the state of the motors and the state of the sensors. We did 25 trials of, of each of those conditions I just described to you and, uh, and showed there that I uh, <clears throat> and then picked from the 25 uh, best trials of each. We did uh, five uh, we picked the five best performing trials from each of the 25 uh, sets of experiments that we did. Uh, picked as being best because they best regulated uh, the glucose level to stay within the viability regions. They incurred the least damage. Now, there's no evolution going on here. I haven't skipped over anything. There's, I, I've described to you the full experimental setup, maybe in, in course detail, but I've described it all to you. And, uh, and so, as you're, you probably are not surprised to see that uh, in, in these five cases here, there, there is no good regulation of, of the essential variable. So just to describe what you're seeing, the square plots show the overhead view of the arena with the dark lines tracing the path taken by the robots. And the more rectangular plots up at the top show the, the time series showing the dynamics of the essential variable over time. And in all five of these cases, you see the essential variable sort of bouncing into the lower viability limit. So it's really not doing very well. It's doing something close to never eating. It's eating sometimes, but not enough to, to stay away from that lower viability limit. So there's no real surprise there. And really, the, the main purpose of this control scenario was just to show that this problem is not trivially solved. Uh, but then if we look at the experimental condition, and remember, the only difference here is that part of the sensory motor space of the robot is the glucose levels, we see something quite different. So again, this is the top five performing trials done from 25 uh, experiments. Uh, and so we see five different uh, patterns of behavior that all involved alternating between eating and not eating. And they all have their own personality a little bit, uh, but, but they're all managing to regulate glucose to, to stay within limits for the most part. Uh, and, uh, and so I hope you're wondering a little bit right now, how could, how could this be? Why on earth would, I've, I've got no deliberate selection pressure. I've got, you know, I've got nothing hardwired into the system to say, you need to keep this glucose level regulated within the viability limits. There's no evolution again, uh, and anything like that. So, so why, why is this working? Why are these robots falling into patterns of behavior that are re regulating glucose to stay within the viability limits? Here's the best uh, explanation I have at the moment. So the IDSM, if you recall, only allows behavior generating mechanisms to persist if they revisit sensory motor states. So if you're not revisiting the sensory motor state, then, then that node that was there before is gonna degrade and be washed out. So when we include uh, the essential variable, the glucose, as one of the sensory motor dimensions, the values of that variable must also, must be revisited as part of a regular pattern if the behavior is to persist. 
So if you look at these two examples in the bottom two plots here, if you look at the one labeled unstable, sorry, uh, you see that the uh, we've got a, a constant change in the essential variable G. So it's constantly moving up. So you're never revisiting values of the essential variable. And only, and so that, that there's not gonna be anything that's stable there. There's no way to reinforce nodes that are being created there. Whereas in the stable uh, situation on the right, if you have a cycle, then that cycle automatically implies that, that, that the essential variable is being kept within some range. Now, maybe that range would be outside of the, the viability limits, but here I've drawn it as being inside, and I'll explain in a minute why it's biased to create ones that are inside. So what I'm saying here is that the, because the, the essential variable is included as a dimension in the sensory motor space, the only habits that form that are going to be stable are going to be ones which keep the essential variable within some range. The hormonal regulation biases the kinds of uh, habits that can form. So a pattern of activity that does not keep the system within the viability limits will eventually cause a hormonal regulation to occur. So you hear this zigzag pattern. It hits the viability boundary, and a moment later, you have this hormonal interaction which, which radically changes glucose. And this is a relatively rare event, and it's a, an event that doesn't correspond very tightly with the motor activity of the robot and the sensors. Uh, and so it's one that will often disrupt a habit. So this might be a stable habit if it weren't for the hormonal regulation. It is also the case that sometimes habits would form where, which would involve this hormonal re regulation. So this is in a sense a very bad or unhealthy habit uh, where you have this trajectory that causes the, the, the robot to not to eat too much in this case and, uh, and then the hormones kick in and kick it on a trajectory but that trajectory causes it to come back to where it was before and to repeat this unhealthy behavior and just it's very interesting to think maybe with some more investigations if there might be some insight that this model could be used in terms of trying to figure out how to break people's bad habits and so on. So just some very quick closing comments. I know I'm a little bit over time, but, but I've just got, I think, two slides left, which are quite brief. Uh, and these are, these are thoughts that I'm, I'm still working through, but, uh, but I'd love to, to have some discussion about. To some extent, I think you can say in this system, there's a, a shared essential variable where the biological essential variable, glucose, is also an essential variable for the behavior. Uh, it's clear that uh, if you, the, the hormonal regulation that, that perturbs glucose out of a pattern will break that particular habit. So uh, it is the same essential variable in the, two, in the two systems, but the viability limits are a bit different. And this means that although they're sharing an essential variable, it doesn't guarantee that what's good for the behavior is good for the organism. Um, and then uh, I think this is my last thought here. I think there's a, a uh, you can make the, the case that uh, the way that this model works is different than some of the pre previous work on homeostatic robotics uh, in that there's no arbitrary pre-selection of behavioral essential variables or their viability limits. Uh, so work uh, done by Ezekiel de Paolo and Hiro Izuka, I can't describe in detail now, but in, in when they're trying to create these kinds of habits, they, they predefine regions where they say, for instance, a neuron's activity can't get too high or too low. Um, and that's what they define as the essential variable and they define these viability limits. Whereas in my model, the, the viability limits of behavior really have to do with the form of the behavior. Uh, and uh, I think you have this more emergent sense of uh, essential variables and viability limits for the behavior. Uh, in the sense that it's the behavior's environment, uh, in particular the hormonal regulatory dynamics that tends to disrupt certain behaviors. And just as a piece of evidence to emphasize why or how this is different than the work uh, in pre previous homeostatic robotics work, it's possible in my system, as I, I mentioned a moment ago, for uh, unhealthy, biologically unhealthy behaviors to become stable in the system. Okay, I think that's me out of time. I'll put some links to, to videos. Uh, online because they're, they're fun to watch and might might inspire further interest in, in the model. So uh, thanks for your time. And I will turn off my screen share now. Okay. okay. Uh, um, thanks thanks very, very much. much. That's it. Uh, that was good. Good. Lots, Lots of questions, of questions now. Uh, um, although I'm coming to, I'm echoing a very substantial but I'm not, not sure, sure if, if uh, Why don't I put my headphones on that's here? That's I think that's my fault here. You're coming okay. to your speaker.
Um, so thanks for supporting that. So uh, while I give people an opportunity to um, ask a question, the, the Q&A app, if it's not active for you, try to mouse over towards the left-hand side of the screen. You may be able to click on the Q&A app um, and ask a question. I'll give uh, people an opportunity to um, word their questions a little bit and um, and um, post them then. And the other, an alternative way of asking a question is by posting one to the EnselSeminars.com website. So if you click in to Matthew's um, presentation there, the discus uh, comment section at, uh, just beneath the, the details of Matthew's talk, um, if you can't get the Q&A app to work, then the uh, the comment section there is an alternative means by which you'll be able to um, uh, you'll be able to ask a question. I can read them out to to Matthew if needs be. Um, so Matthew, actually, I've, I've to be honest, I have lots of questions. Um, <laughs> the first is I'll sort of ask a first simple terminological one, mm. um, which has to do with just a, a particular phrase you used earlier on in your talk um, about there being a. Um, biological autonomy and behavioral autonomy being metaphorically linked. Mm. And I'm just wondering if the relationship isn't actually much stronger than that. If, um, is the, is it, do you think it is just metaphorical um, or do you think there is something more substantial in the relationship? Uh, yes, I guess uh, I'm not sure exactly how to answer that. So I think that in a sense it is a strong connection, but I don't know. You know how there's all these uh, different metaphors that have been used to describe the mind over time. You know, the mind is like a catapult. The mind is like a computer, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, all of those are are just metaphorical. I don't know. This is a description about the way uh, the components building the system uh, interact and and their interdependence. So, yeah, I guess I would I would agree with I think what, what you're insinuating is that it's a it is a more uh, more substantial connection than just a metaphor, but. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, great. So I have a um, now. I'm just having a, a, a quick check on just in case there's uh, we, just in case people are trying to to tweet. Okay. Uh, questions as well. And um, we so also, I, go ahead. Yeah. No. Sorry. Explain. I was just going to say that we can also leave it there and have people uh, ask questions by way of the the website if the, if that. Is easier. Yeah. Um, certainly, the uh, if the the Q and A app isn't working for people, then um, the the website um, is certainly an opportunity to um, to ask them that, uh, or to, to sort of. I, I suspect as well that many questions may well want to dig into some of the technical issues, which um, are uh, maybe a little bit difficult, or in fact, easier to do um, when you have a prolonged text response. Mm -hmm. um, but if I could just get you to say um, one more thing, actually, just to, to sort of t touch on the something that, um, for example, you talked about the um, the relationship between the habit and the environment, and that's something that, in fact, um, I'm going to speak with you in more depth about at some point when we have mm -hmm. an opportunity to chat. Um, but the um, the IDSM itself doesn't specifically incorporate the environment. But there's going to be a really interesting and very important relationship, it would seem, between the IDSM and the environment in which it's operating. And I guess I, um, my question is very broad, which is to say that, and do you have anything to say or have you done any work on what the relationship between the IDSM and its environment would be or how that relationship affects the way habits form? Yeah, so I've thought about it some. I haven't done any uh, explicit studies, but I think it's a great area to investigate more. Um, you're right, the IDSM doesn't explicitly include any aspects of the environment, but there's no doubt that the environment plays a very important role in determining uh, what patterns are possible to be self-stabilizing within the IDSM. So as I mentioned in the talk, for a uh, habit to, to be self-reinforcing, you need to have a cycle in the sensory motor dynamics. Uh, and the environment influences where and when that's possible. So as an extreme example, imagine you have an environment which has a cliff in it and you have a behavior which involves falling off of that cliff, then it's going to be very difficult to repeat that kind of behavior. Um, and the kind of environment that I have with the light in, in the center, you can see in some of those plots that I showed that there's a variety of, of behaviors, but they all relate to the environment in, in particular ways. 
uh, which are heavily driven by the environment. So I, I describe the habits as being the self-reinforcing patterns in sensory motor space, but, but, but that's actually not fair because the, the patterns also definitely include dynamics in the environment as well. And for instance, if you had a, a habit in the model that I described to you, any of those trajectories I showed, and you were to suddenly remove the light from the environment, the, 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 that habit would fail. The, 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 it would be impossible to recreate those sensory motor dynamics. Uh, and so, as I said, the, the habit is built not only of dynamics within the sensory motor space, but also very much dependent upon relationships with the environment. Okay. Um, I like I like that sense. There's a there's a sense in which the there is a shadow of the environment cast in sensory motor space, mm -hmm. um, and that's I suppose that that's probably going to trigger that's, trigger warnings required for um, for the anti representationalists <laughs> there. And I'm not suggesting um, that that's this kind of it's representational, but there is a um, an, an interesting complementary relationship there that, mm -hmm. that's I suppose inherent to the way the IDSM operates. I'd love to do some kind of uh, systematic investigation of how the environment uh, uh, sculpts or biases the formation of habits. Uh, I think it could be really interesting. Yes, excellent. Um, okay, so the, um, the the now we've what we've already had some um, technical issues uh, this afternoon. So I'm, I'm it'll be hopefully there will be. Um, if people have questions, they, they're not having too much trouble with the Q&A app. Um, but as you say, um, the Ansel Seminars website has um, the discus um, comment section and the sort of real opportunity to um, dig into some of the, the niceties of the, uh, the model that you've presented. Um, and as I said, I'm, uh, once we're in a less public forum, I'm going to nag your ear on this one. So, uh, <laughs> some, really, uh, some really important work to be done here, actually. Um, so thank you very much, Matthew, for um, an excellent engaging talk. And um, we will see, uh, well, we won't see, everyone else will see us in a month's time um, for the next Enso um, seminar. Great. Thanks, Mark. Bye-bye, everybody.